Thanks for tuning in to the Lean 911 podcast where you'll have a voice directly from the Gemba. I will rely on my three decades of lean successes as well as my failures to answer your most challenging questions regarding your lean transformation. I'm your host, Mark Deluzio, President and CEO of Lean Horizons Consulting and the Principal Architect of the Danaher Business System. Looking forward to your questions now. Let's go to the Gemba. Hi, Mark Deluzio here. Uh, episode 25 with Lean 911 podcast. Uh, today we're going to talk about my 10 rules of a process. You'll probably come up with 20 more rules, but these are the 10 rules that I kind of like to think about when I evaluate uh, a process. Now, going back to episode number uh, 22, which is the fifth of a six part series in problem solving, and most likely there'll be more problem solving uh, uh, episodes as we go forward, but right now there's six. But the fifth one, episode 22, I talked about types of problems. And this one kind of ties into this, this episode ties back into that particular episode of types of problems. And just to review, remember type zero problem is no process exists at all. So when you're looking at a problem, the first thing I ask is, is there a process? Okay. If it's not at the type zero problem, that gives you a certain course of action. Uh, a type one problem would be, yeah, there is a, a standard or a process. However, it's not being followed. And the type two problem is there is a process, but it's not giving you the result. It's being followed, but it's not giving you the result that you're looking at. So as you think about process, whether you're creating one, cause it doesn't exist type zero or it's not being followed in a lot. And we talked about the reasons why that could be, and there are several. And of course, a type two problem where we have a process, but it's not giving you the outcome that you're looking for. Um, uh, the rules I'm going to talk about apply to all of those in terms of when you look at a process and make sure that you've got this process uh, as buttoned up as, as, as possible. So if you're watching on, uh, on, on YouTube, I will share my screen and show you my presentation. If not, you won't miss a thing because I'll walk you through and make sure that uh, you don't miss you don't miss the thing. So let me uh, let me share my screen. Give me a moment here while I do some technical things, and uh, hopefully you'll be able to see that. So ten rules according to Mark Deluzio of a process. By the way, I was asked to do this for a uh, a a uh, uh, be a keynote speaker on a, uh, for a, 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 a lean, uh, conference and I've never really written down my rules of a process. It's kind of mm -hmm. odd cause I didn't have a process for a process. Right. And, and when I came up with it, it came out to 10 and it looked like the David Letterman, if you, if you remember who he was, always had his 10, his 10 top 10 list. Right. Well, this came out to be 10 rules and it looked like I'm smart because I'm saying, Hey, there's 10, right. But if you really think hard enough, you'll probably come up with a couple more that you might want to add to this. But I, I thought I'd stop there. Sometimes I like to do things in tens because it doesn't, uh, it doesn't get crazy. Uh, although you might argue 10 is crazy, but let's go through this. Now, the first thing I want to do is talk about, you know, what, what really is a process. And I've got a definition here. You probably have your own definition, but you know, a systematic series of activities directed towards causing an end result such that one or more inputs will be acted upon to create one or more outputs. Now it applies to products, to services, information, any kind of, you know, oh, process where you, where you're expecting an outcome has to be a result of some semblance of a process. Otherwise you're not going to get the consistency and the sustainability as, uh, as you look at this on an ongoing basis. So anyway, that's my definition. It's a definition. Uh, I'm saying it's only definition. I'm gonna say it's the best definition, but it's one that, uh, that I'm using here. And I think for all practical purposes, this would, uh, would suffice, right? Okay. So let's look at rule number one. If a process is not documented. It's not a process. Okay. Period. So anybody who says to you, Hey, 
Yeah. Oh, do you have a process for that? Oh yeah, yeah. We have a process for that. Oh, can you show it to me? I mean, we don't, we don't have it written down, but we kind of know. Oh, you kind of know. Okay. You mean to tell me 30 of your sales guys have a cost value selling process. They all do it the same way. And, uh, there's no variation and, and it's not written down, right? You're trying to tell me that. So my rule is if you can't email it to me, it's not a process. Okay. Uh, what happens Poor quality poor customer service, you get variation, high costs. You know, it's one of those deals where I have an idea in my mind, what, what it might be. And, and, and so do you, and so does the third person. And at least we have three different versions of this process, at least in our mind. Now, when I go to make a change, uh, does, does everybody participate in that change? Where do I just do it for me or for you? And what of the other 30 people? So the nice part about having a standard or a process, and by the way, I'm going to use the word process and standard interchangeably. And I know the, the lean, uh, uh the lean, uh, academics are all, both will, will take issue with me on that. But for, for, for this purpose, and by the way, I do understand the difference between job instructions and standard work and all that good stuff. But when I say standard, you know, if you have a process that is your standard, okay. Then of course your, your process will talk more about the details of what, what goes into it, you know, coming up with the next nine rules, but I will use those words interchangeably. Okay. So the nice part about having a standard in this regard is that if I'm going to make a change, I change it once and I change it for everybody. So it's one change. Okay. And we all adhere to that new change. Obviously I want everybody's input who's doing the work to, to come up with these improvements and these changes, but you know, this is the kind of thing that we want to look at as a standard that we all want to adhere to. You know, as Tashi Ono said, he said, without a standard, there can be no improvement. Okay. And, uh, I really do believe that now, just because your process is documented doesn't mean it's a process. Because there's other criteria that I'm going to talk about in a bit that make up what I would say a good, robust process is all about. So this is like a, uh, if, if you remember the Nate game of Monopoly, been around since the depression, I believe the 1930s, you cannot pass go and collect $200 could probably make that $2,000 today with inflation, but cannot pass go, go and collect $200. If this rule is not cut off. Okay. So that's the first thing. If it's not documented, it's not a process. Rule two, whether the processes are a product process an administrative or workflow information flow, we should display these processes visually as much as possible. Now you can't do that for every process. I got all that. But the ones that really matter, you know, we should display them visibly. And how do we do that? You know, and, and by the way, on the bottom of my presentation, I'm talking about different, uh, uh, tools you might think about, you know, visual management, of course, is one. u shaped cell is a visual depiction of a process, believe it or not. Okay. And I can see a lot of things in a u shaped cell. I can see inventory bills. I can see, uh, imbalances of, of work sequences to tack time. Uh, Gemba boards is another one, value stream mapping, process mapping, flow charts, et cetera, right? And those aren't the only ones, but display them visual, visual, visibly. Now, in my early days in my career, I used to work for Lego, the toy company. And still to this day, the instructions that come with Lego are all visual. So I can take the same set of instructions and give it to a child in India, China, South America. Europe, doesn't matter where, and they can all work off the same instruction sheet to put the toy together. All right. No words, all visual. And we actually have a little bit of a, uh, exercise that we do where we create a, I think it's a bow, um, uh, a little Lego bow. And, and so what happens is we take two people in front of the room and set them back to back. One person, we give a bunch of written instructions to, with the same, you know, Lego set. And the other person, we give the, the, the pictorial instructions and the person with the, the pictures gets done in like a minute and a half, two minutes. And it's right. No quality defects. You look at the instructions for, uh, 
the written and it says things like take a two by two blue brick and put the, uh, put a uh two by four yellow brick on the end of the two by two you know that's the kind of instructions you got there and it always gets messed up they never finish and it's kind of comical okay we usually like to put the senior leader in that position and put even so and have a little bit of fun right but it just shows the point that the visuals are so much more powerful and you know, you got to think about the quality considerations when you've got good, clear work instructions in this case, or in this case, a process that's clear to everybody at a glance. And, uh, it's easy to follow without any, uh, mystery to that. Okay. So that's rule number two. We want to be able to display visually where possible. Three rule three. Now we're getting into, you know, detailed job instructions. Every process should have those detailed job instructions with assigned roles and responsibilities. Who does what and when do they do it by? And we should develop these processes in collaboration with the people who do the work. They're our best consultants at the end of the day. All right. So again, keep it visual. It's always preferred over written, right? And if you go back to training within industries, TWI, uh, that, that has a lot of good content for you to think about in terms of how you would do this. Okay. So we want our, you know, standard operating procedures and job instructions. We want all these things documented, but we want to develop them and improve them with the frontline people who do the work. They're the, they're your best consultants. And if Tasha Yono said, when you do standard work. It should not come from, you know, leadership. It should be, uh, it should be produced or, or created by the people who do the work. All right. So, uh, and they'll tell you, you know, no, no, that, that blue wire can't go there because uh, the red one has to go first. So we do the blue one, this happens. And I've seen a lot of frontline operators go toe to toe with engineers who develop the product and develop the process. And they're usually right. The operators are usually right in terms of they know what's going on. Now, I always recommend having an engineer or quality engineer with the operator while we're doing this so that we don't violate any kind of, you know, engineering principles or, you know, obviously safety is always a number one concern. But even in an administrative process, how many times have you heard, that's not what happens there. Yeah. Oh, geez. I didn't know you did that. Oh, you guys do that all the way down there. Well, I can take care of that up here and you don't have to do this. You know. I, all that kind of thing, because what I'm learning over the years is that most people in a company, and it's not a criticism, this is the way we kind of lay out the work, don't understand how their business operates. They don't know, they don't understand how their business works. And that's been my experience. And when I say the business works, they may understand they're part of the world, but they don't understand the whole, the whole picture. And this is why it's important to involve people all the way through. Okay. So step number three, rule number three. You should have detailed job instructions along with this, with assigned roles as to who does what, when. And, you know, when you tie back your daily management, you want to be able to check and detect when those standards are not being followed because that is a cause for failure, right? That's a type, uh, a type one problem. If you go back to that episode number 22. So we want to be able to detect the abnormalities all the way through this. Okay. Rule four, this may sound like a no-brainer to you, but all associates need to be properly trained on the process with periodic refresher train, training, okay, to assure compliance, right? How many times have we set up a process so we just poorly train people? It's not their fault, but we just didn't train them. We just didn't train them in the workings of the process and you know, and when I say training and refresher training as well, everybody needs that because sometimes we get into our old habits and we get workarounds that nobody knows about because <laughs> we don't have good abnormality detection. And so what we want to be able to do is, uh, is continue to make sure everybody's on the same page. There are times to do Kaizen and remember, we're not going to be changing these standards every day. We've got to run and stabilize them. And it's written you now, if there's, you know, some serious issues with them. That could be corrected right away. Fine. Because especially if it relates to safety, but we can't do Kaizen every day. We have to have a stabilization period so we can sustain. 
and assess the viability of the process or standard. And then at a predetermined point, we run a content event to make it better and just take it up to the next level. Again, involving the people that do the work. Okay. So quick story. We, uh, uh, at Jake break way back in the uh, late eighties, when I started at Danaher and, you know, as you probably know, the history, the uh, Jake break was run by George Konisaker and also Art Byrne above him. And, and they hired me in, uh, in 1987. And we had created what we call the Jacobs uh, Improvement System, was our suggestion system. And we we're pretty happy because we were tracking uh, two suggestions per employee per month. We had a UAW workforce. Okay, so we we're pretty proud of that. I think I talked about this on a previous episode. So anyway, I went to Hino Motors, which was one of my accounts. I was making Jake breaks for Hino, which is part of Toyota, top customer. And we saw a chart on the wall that said nine, nine, uh, suggestions per month per employee, but they were implemented suggestions and, and our suggestions were just suggestions. They weren't necessarily implemented. Matter of fact, somebody could have said, Hey, paint the building pink. And we were to covet it as a suggestion, right? So we asked them how they did that. And they said, well, geez, you know, we provide the training for problem solving. So that was a big deal. And if you remember in one of the pro problem solving, uh, episodes, I talked about how Toyota said, Hey, look, the, the world-class company is really defined by how well they solve problems. And even the great Toyota have, they have problems, but we only solve our problems once. Why they get to the root cause, right? So this all ties back to that. Okay. But anyway, Keener Motors not only provides the training. They provide the resources, whether it's uh, maintenance, tool room, engineering, IT, whatever it is. And they give the employees time to solve problems. On Friday afternoon, they took that time out of the available time when they calculated the attack time, and they gave Friday afternoon time for them to work on problems. Okay. So they walked the talk, right, in this regard. And some of these problems that they worked on, if you want to call them problem, some of them are very simple little things that made all the difference in a world when you kind of add them all up. You know, maybe, hey, every fifth part, you know, the fixture sticks because I can't get the part out. It takes me an extra five seconds. You know, you deal with a talk time of 60 seconds, eh, five seconds is a lot of time, right? So, so anyway, they did that. And, and you'll see at the end of this presentation, I have a, a saying about walking the talk in terms of uh, your values and your principles. And I'll hold off on that until we get to it. But anyway, we want to train. The mistake we made at Jake Break that was that when we, we had all the multi-skill skill blocks, we, I actually, you know, uh, negotiated the contract with the UAW to get rid of seniority as the number one determinant of a job. And, and we went to skill blocks. So anybody with more skill blocks can bump somebody with a lot more seniority. Um, we put that in the contract, right? And we paid for knowledge. Our mistake was. We never recertified people. So if you got certified on, let's say CMC machining, but didn't do that job for six months or a year, you were green on that and you were really not valuable in that regard. So we made the mistake of not having a good retraining program, if you will, to keep people's skills up and do a better job at job rotation. Okay. So something to watch out for. You can do all the, all the right things up front, but if you don't have that you know, that the job rotation and, and get people continue to be, you know, uh, honing their skills on whatever job it is to sugar fight on, uh, you'll find yourself doing a lot of rework. And, and that's what we did there. See, everybody thinks that Dan or her, everything went well. Well, it didn't. We made a lot of mistakes and it was one of them. Okay. Rule five. This comes out of my friend Steve Spears, uh, decoding the DNA of the, uh, and Tim Bowen, uh, decoding the DNA of the, uh, Toyota production system. Steve Spears is a friend and I collaborate with him on some of his coursework and his books. And he, uh, wrote this unbelievable article that we still use today. And one of the rules, one of the four rules he talked about is that all product document information, whatever it is should have a clear and direct path with no ambiguities. We know exactly where that product or that information goes next. And there's no question whatsoever 
what that path is. Okay. That's one of the four rules he talks about in the decoding uh, article. Matter of fact, I, I may end up doing a, a, a episode on that article itself because I think it's so, such a powerful article and it's still relevant today. And we ask, you know, our clients to look at that article and say, well, how do you match up against these four, these four rules? And usually we find that mm, we, there's something to be desired. Not a criticism, it's just that they're tough to do. And, but these were the rules that, you know, Toyota came up with as far as how they looked at uh, improvement and, and how they looked at processes and what have you. Okay. So in other words, all processes, movement of a product, document information, should have a clear, direct path with no ambiguities. Okay. And again, standard work is really good for that. When you, you write standard work, real standard work, uh, uh, that word gets thrown around a lot in terms of what real standard work means. Uh, but anyway, that's, uh, uh, one of the things you might think about when you try to understand what this all means. So rule number six, assure the quality of the product or the service or the information before passing it on to the next process or to the next customer. It could be an internal customer, could be your final customer, but Lord knows we don't want our customers to be our inspectors, right? So assure the quality. Now there's a difference between quality assurance and quality uh, control. Quality control is checking the quality after the fact. In other words, inspection. Okay. And I always challenge people to say, well, you know, geez, if your manufacturing process could produce hundred percent good quality, what makes you think your inspection is going to be hundred percent good quality, right? So quality control is a lot different than quality assurance where quality assurance, you're building quality into the process where either you can't make a mistake with a pokey oak mistake proof device, or you catch it. With a Jadoka, and you don't continue to propagate the same uh, error. Okay. This is why we want to do one piece flow. We don't want to do that. I don't want to build a thousand just to find out, oh, geez, you know what? They were all wrong. So I check them with an inspection device. If I have a, an inspection device and I, and, I, and I have one bad part, that's my limitation. So you can improve your quality numbers. Believe it or not, why not improve your quality? But just wait, processing your parts differently in a one piece flow fashion, because you're reducing the exposure to batch quality rejects, right? So, so rule number six, you must assure the quality. Now I know that's a lot easier said than done. Think about every process step you have in your business, whether it be administrative or what, right? Now, when you look at, when you look at what we usually do is we sometimes institutionalize rework. And I've seen this time and time again. I had a client one time that told me they had 21 people re-inspecting the product based on their bad quality to the customer. And the customer said, no, you have to re-inspect it. We want you to re-inspect it. So they said to me, uh, Mark, we need to do standard work in our re-inspection department. There are like 20, 21 people there. They go, excuse me? Yeah, yeah, we need to put, we need to become more efficient in our reinspection department. You need to become more efficient and do a rework. How about we focus our Kaizen efforts on eliminating the need to do the rework? Yeah, sure. We're going to have to still convince the client or the customer that we, we have attained, uh, we, we, we slayed this animal. Okay. But why are we going to try to get really good at doing something really bad? In other words, we're trying to optimize something that's just suboptimal. That is not the road to prosperity. Okay. But I refuse to do it. I said, no, I am not going to do that. I'm not going to have you get better at rework. I will though work on figuring out why you have a quality problem, but I'm not going to get better. At, I'm not going to have you get better at rework. That's just not, that's not what we do. And it, it would be sacrilegious if we did that. Okay. So building quality in is harder than not. Now, a lot of people say, well, you know, we have SPC, uh, statistical process control, and we check one of the 15 parts. And this actually happened to me. 
uh, I think it was the Wata um, Shinga Jitsu said to me, Mark, <clears throat> you're chucking one of our 15 parts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have, uh, we have SBC. Now here I am, t- a young, young whippersnapper thinking I know it all, right? Um, and, and I'm telling him Wata about SBC, like he doesn't know what that is, right? I said, no, you know what I said? I said, you don't understand. I said, we, we took one out of 15 and we put out a control chart and, you know, up a, up a little control MS and we look for this kind of pattern and blah, 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 blah. Well, let's have time. You are violating the rule that we just talked about earlier, which was you're not assuring quality for those other 14 parts. You're allowing unknown quality to go down the line. It's unknown. You don't know if they're good. No, well, I really do know because, you know, and if, hey, by the way, our exposure would only be 15 parts. And if we find a bad part, then we'll like, Delucio son, he looks at me and he says, would you fly an airline that only checks one of 15 airplanes? And right there, he had me. Okay. He's made, got it. Now, does that mean they throw out your SPC? No, no. Because that's your only line of defense right now. You still got to use it. But ultimately, you want to get out of SBC because you're going to build in quality with Pokeyoke devices, which are state proof devices, or Jadoka, which is a, uh, you know, the, the equipment stops when it detects the defect. And by the way, Jadoka, by the way, is a whole respect for people thing. You don't want employees standing there watching a machine run. Can you imagine standing in front of your clothes dryer, watching your clothes dryer run all day? No, you walk away, you go do something else, right? So why would you do that? Why would you have an employee stand there, hang his brain on a book and just stand there and watch this machine to make, and by the way, if there is a, let's say a tool breaks or whatever happens, they can't catch it in time anyway. So why are you standing there? You know? So, um, anyway, just a little bit of additional, you know, thought process around Judoka, but, um, Assuring the quality, this is rule number six, before you pass it on. You got to do that on a priority basis, though. You can't do it, you know, just on everything. You got to really think about, well, where did, what is it most needed and work on those first, right? And again, this is not as easy to do as it sounds. I think you probably know that if you did ever try to do this. Rule seven. I put this one in here because waiting time of all the waste that I've seen the seven, you know, own no waste of, you know, defects and inventory and over-processing and all that. Waiting time to me is such a, 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 a culprit of so many bad things. Okay. I think it's the most detrimental waste in the, in the, in the, in the series of seven wastes. And some say eighth waste because of, you know, unused creativity. That wasn't put on as original, but in... It affects your quality, your batching queue operations, you know, built up quality, like we talked about earlier, improper loading of equipment in and operators to tech time, you know, all this stuff, waiting time is huge. And, you know, when people ask me, Hey, Mark, what do you do for a living? And I tell them why I do lean management. And, you know, after I get past the fact that I have to explain that I'm not a weight loss program and, uh, you know, a diet program, which in a way we kind of are right. We're taking waste away from a process. So here's how I explain it. I say, well, you know, if you ever went out and bought furniture, which most people have done, and they tell you it takes 12 weeks for the chair that you want to order. So you're ordering a desk chair. I'll ask somebody, hey, how long does it take to actually make that chair? And they'll give you a number. Some will say three hours, some will say a day, eight hours, you know, whatever. But it's not 12 weeks. Okay. No matter what they come up with, it's never going to be anywhere near 12 weeks that they promised the product to you for. So I said, well, look, my job is take the waste out of the process. And it's not all transportation, by the way, take the waste out of the process and get to 12 weeks as close to the three hours as possible. That's what I do for a living. And and when we do that, we're taking care of quality issues, rework, lead time, inventory, throughput you know, safety, getting rid of batching cues, getting rid of what? Waiting time. And this is something that a lot of lead people out there need to really start pounding the desk on. Lead time, if you can reduce the lead time, 
And everybody likes to focus on process time. And I'm not saying don't focus on process time, but lead time is the biggest competitive advantage you can bring to the party, assuming you've got the, you've got the right level of quality. Okay. And I've taken, you know, we, we had an acquisition. I think I talked about this earlier, but you know, we had a, uh, bought this company over in England and they made a, a commodity. It was a temperature controller. And, and it, he, the manager director told me he had a 28 day lead time, which was cutting edge because his competition was at 35. And I looked at it and I thought to myself, I said, well, that's not much of a, much of an advantage, but haven't done this now for a number of years within Danaher and other businesses. I said, Hey, I think we can get you down to three days, lead time, three days. No way, Mark, you can do it. There's absolutely no way you can do it. It's impossible, blah, 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 blah. Anyway, over the course of nine months, we got down to three days and I won't go through the gory details of what we did. And by the way, inventory turns went from like three to 18. Uh, for that period of time and, uh, our time delivery went from like 30% to request day two in the high nineties. Okay. Now their dis distribution customers, which were most distribution customers were, were delighted that they didn't have to carry the inventory because we had a three day lead time. They got measured on what's called giveaway growth margin. We turn on investment. That's their main measurement in a distribution facility. And return on investment, the investment is inventory for the most part. Well, you're taking away, you know, basically instead of them carrying, you know, 45 days of inventory, they're, they're probably carrying five days. Okay. And, and we could respond in three, even shorter if we needed to, but that grew the business from 30,000 units a year to 110,000 units in one year, more than triple the business. Okay. Almost four times because we reduce the lead time. So the, if you focus on lead time and then ask yourself, what's getting in my way? Is it machine downtime or supplier delivery? Uh, is it, uh, the fact that, uh, we, uh, have poor flow, uh, we have quality issues. I mean, there could be a number of reasons why you can't take that lead time down closer to the processing time. Well. There on a priority basis is how you lay out your Kaizen opportunities to say, okay, here's what I'm going to work on first, second, and third. Of course, safety is always going to be number one, right? So if you have unsafe practices that don't affect your lead time, you still got to take care of that. Okay. And then quality and then delivery and then cost in that order, right? Typically you take care of quality, making sure safety is in check. You will drive not only your lead times, but you'll drive your cost. And you'll drive all kinds of good things, customer delight and all that good stuff. Okay. So, so waiting, I put this in as a rule because I wanted to really accentuate this. And, you know, a lot of times this just happens to be how we decide to process the product or the document, you know, got long lead times. Let me give you an unrelated example to manufacturing. Well, there's manufacturing, but it's new product development. I was working with a client that had a 48 new. 48 month new product development process. And I talked to the head of engineering. I said, let me ask you, how many engineers do you have? And he told me, and I said, okay, well, of all your engineers that are working on developing new products, how many products or programs are they working on at any given point in time? And he says, uh, probably four, maybe five, each engineer, they each have four or five projects that they're working on. So I said, okay, so let me ask you this question. I said, uh, when an engineer is working on product, you know, product A, what is B, C, D, and E doing? And he paused and he thought about it and he said, waiting. Yeah, they're waiting. Nothing's happening to those projects, right? Well, he's working on one, the other four are waiting, which is just like you see in best manufacturing, right? So I said, there's your lead time. If you can think about how to flow your designs through your engineering group, you might have to put them into product families. Maybe some guys do software, some guys do hardware, you know, whatever the case may be. Then you, you can, you know, everything else being equal, you'll re, if you, if, if, if you, if each engineer has four projects, if you can flow them, you will by definition, take your lead time down by 75% by going to one piece flow. Okay. And, uh, yeah, you'd have to understand the tack time. 
in the amount of work that gets done, which is the work sequence of the engineer. And you're going to hear all this kind of stuff too. Like, oh, you know, every project is different and they're not all the same. They're not standardized. They'll give you all the reasons why you can't do it. Meanwhile, my answer is, yeah, it might be difficult. We'll have to figure something out. We'll have to figure out how to, you know, set value streams and in, in, in engineering and all that. I got all that. But I can tell you one thing, the answer is not what you do or not. Okay. So you can give me all the reasons why these ideas won't work. And by the way, I've done them. So they do work in complex areas too. But you can give me all the reasons why these things don't work. And I will tell you, no matter what the recommendation, it's better than what you're doing now. Okay. So think about waiting time and lead time. Okay. It is an unbelievable opportunity for you to really drive um, growth, profitable growth in, in results. Okay. I spent a lot of time on rule number seven because I'm very passionate about this. Most lead people think about productivity. Hey, what's the productivity? It's like the operator really is going to, you know, dog it and not want to, you know, work. It's like, we're going to keep pounding those operators. It's the process, not the person that we're looking at. Okay. So shift your focus to lead time and quality. And I can guarantee you good things will happen. And by the way, the considerations here is, is related to product or documents or whatever. In my case, I said, you know, new product development, flow first, where you can't flow, pull where you can't flow, but never push, never, ever push. Okay. All right. Rule eight. Processes need to be evolved through the rigorous application of Kaiser. I cannot tell you how many companies that I'm running into that say they're doing lean and they get all the Gimba boards up and they waste time in the morning walking from Gimba board to Gimba board, you know, and they're usually expediting meetings. Say, hey, Charlie, where's that part coming in? You know, yeah, we'll get that machine up. Uh, hey, Bill, we'll get that machine up by three o'clock today. Okay, yeah, why are we going for a second shift? That's not a Gimba walk. But nobody has the guts to call foul on that. The elephant in the room, those Gimba walks are a waste of time in a lot of cases. I'm not trying to, you know, throw Gimba walks under the bus or Gimba boards for that matter. But I very rarely see them be done right. Matter of fact, almost never. Okay. And, but then you ask yourself, okay, you got all the posters and stuff and you put the yellow tape on the floor and you got your Gimba boards up and everybody has their polo shirts with their logo on Kaizen and all that. Then you say to yourself, well, how many Kaizen do you guys do? Well, we don't really do Kaizen because, you know, we got a lot going on. And I, I was even told one time, uh, uh, we can't really do Kaizen until things get better. Same with standard work. You can't do Kaizen until we take care of some things and get better. So I, so how long have you been here? You've been here eight years? And you still got these issues? What's going to happen different tomorrow that didn't happen over the last eight years? Okay. Kaizen is the way. It's like saying to your, your doctor, hey, you know, doctor, I'm not going to go to physical therapy until my shoulder gets better. It's ludicrous. Nobody's doing Kaizen. Nobody wants to take the time out and do it. And when they do do it, they do it between the hours of one and four. Once a week. Every month. And it's like nobody's committing to this. And even how to run a Kaizen is an issue, but I'll, I'll take that problem. First, let's commit the time and focus on doing Kaizen on things that matter. That's going to drive us to our practice. So you said, you know, well, geez, you know, we've been doing lean for, uh, for five years and we don't really see any, any, any improvements. And so like Arnold Schwarzenegger not going to the gym, but he wants to become Mr. Universe. It's not going to happen. It's just not going to happen if you don't do Kaizen. No. People say, well, Mark, how many Kaizen should we do? I'm not going to give you that number. All I know is zero is not the answer because that's what you're doing now. Okay. I just cannot believe how we are not doing Kaizen. All these companies that say they're doing lean, they're not doing Kaizen. Formal Kaizen events. Okay. So please, if you're going to do this, do rule number eight. Evolve your processes to a rigorous application of Kaizen. Otherwise, take down the posters, 
take down the gumbo boards and pull up the yellow tape and go back to what you were doing before. You wasted a lot of money and you wasted a lot of time. And it, quite frankly, it's disrespect to people when you do it that way. You're asking people to improve, but you're not giving them the framework in which to do so. Unfair. Not good. Okay. I have a note down here that says uh, a majority of your Kaizen should be directed back to your strategic deployment or your ocean. Okay. I got a number here, like 70%. I don't like numbers like that. I put them in there, but you know, whatever the number is, we should be, in other words, we should be working on things that really matter to us. Okay. Now, if your fundamentals are broken, your you know, quality is broken, safety, quality, delivery, then that's where you got to focus because you can't profitably grow if, you're, uh, if your fundamentals are broken, right? And I came up with a saying to Dana that said, you have to earn the right to grow. That means fix your operations and move on from there, okay? So please, we'll liberate processes need to be about the rigorous application of guys in. Otherwise, don't waste your time. Do not waste your time. Okay, rule nine. Key performance indicators are what we call KPIs should be developed to track um, the adherence to the process and process outcomes. Now, process outcomes are usually what I would call a lagging indicator. I talked about this in one of the problem solving uh, uh, episodes. The di- matter of fact, it's titled The Difference Between a Lagging and a Leading Indicator. So I won't really repeat a lot of that. So you can go back and listen to that. But a leading indicator are really the ones that, that are, are shakers and movers, if you will, that will, will you get those right and your, your process outcomes or your lagging indicators will take care of themselves. And again, I use the example of losing weight. I can look at the scale all I want. But I really need to understand, I should look at the scale to, to, to make sure I'm, I'm hitting my goal of whatever weight I want to you know, obtain. But I shouldn't just focus on that. I should focus on the leading indicators. In this case would be things like calories and exercise and how much sleep that I get and all those things that are the drivers of that lagging indicator called weight on the scale. Okay. So we need to develop key performance indicators, and they should have a cause and effect with the process. One of the mistakes I see is, is that people develop a thousand KPIs and they're tracking all kinds of stuff. And you simply lose sight as to what really matters as it relates back to the process in question. Okay. So keep it skinny and keep it directed towards what you're really looking for, for the process, both the leading and the, uh, wagon indicators. Okay. In rule 10, this kind of talks about Kaizen, but apply the Deming cycle, the plan, do, check, act to continually monitor and correct deviations for the process. Okay. So problem solving is key. If you can't do problem solving and develop that muscle in your lean transformation, then you're missing the boat. And again, you know, to me, after doing lean for well over, you know, three decades, it all comes down to this. It all comes down to How well can we solve problems and not fix problems? Please go back to a previous episode when I talk about problem fixing versus problem solving. There's a big difference. I think you probably know what it is, but if not, go back to that episode, take a look at it and see what it says. Okay. So a lot of tools out there. I happen to like the Pareto diagram. Matter of fact, I was briefly introduced to Dr. Duran, had lunch with him once. I'm not saying he mentored me, but I am a fan of Pareto, not because I met Julian, but it's such a powerful, uh, analytical tool seems simple on the surface, but if you really use it and know how to slice it and dice it, it gets a little bit complex, but to me, it's an unbelievably powerful tool. Now I'm going to say, Hey, there's one size fits all here because there are other tools too. And of course you got your A3, your five Y's, you've got your CDAC, cause and effect diagram, the issue occurred. So a lot of different, you know, problem solving approaches that are out there. Uh, I, I tend to always lean on the Pareto first because I want to understand the data before I, I can write a problem definition statement. I have to understand what's the data telling me. I may have four problems here that I'm only going to come up with one that's, you know, poorly written and ill-defined and then I'm going to come up with a bunch of solutions looking for a problem, which is something I don't want to do. Okay. So rule 10. Apply the dummy problem solving process. Now, you know, you might argue, well, Mark, you know, if you did that, is that a Kaizen? Yeah, maybe. Okay. But there are other tools that you can put in the context of a Kaizen as well. 
that will help you get to where you need to go. Whether it's single minute exchange to die, even that has problem solving implications. It's Pareto with it, right? Uh, TPM, standardized work, Pokio, Kanban, as well. You know, all the linear tools that we have, right? Could be the subject of a particular Kaizen. I usually find though that Kaizians are not just singular focused when it comes to tools. You know, like, for example, I can't do cell design when I'm talking about standard work. And I can't talk about standard work when I'm not talking about visual management or 5S. Okay. So, which are different, by the way. So, you see, what I'm saying, it, it, it's these are Venn diagrams. These, these tools do not stand by themselves. And you have to think about it that way. Okay. That's rule 10. Uh, apply the dummy cycle of the plan to check act to continually monitor incorrect deviations for the process. Closing thought. And I alluded to this earlier. Principles and values without a supporting process are merely slogans. Slogans. We solve problems at the lowest possible level, says the poster. Yeah, well, you're not giving your, your employees the ability, the training, the time, the resources to solve problems. How the heck in the world do you think that's going to happen? We believe in career development of our employees, but we don't have a career development process. And nobody in the room has a career development plan. How the heck are you doing this? Is it based on the individual effort of a particular leader to do it with his people or her people? Good luck with that. Okay. We're talking about variation. So we've got to have processes on the things we say that matter. All right. And when it comes to values, you know, 50% of my performance reviews that I gave, at the, by the way, I'm not a big performance review guy. Uh, I think they're bad processes and I agree with Demi, they should probably be eliminated. The feedback should come back more frequently and, and not batch that way in a, in an annual review. The more I think about that, the more ludicrous that is. But anyway, my reviews that I did do at Danaher, 50% of them had to do with values. Okay. Teamwork, communication, honesty, integrity, you know, all those things that we, we laid out as corporate values, you got measured on. And when I said measured on, it was like, hey, here's some case, you know, here's some information where you didn't adhere to being a team player. Okay. And you need to improve on that or communication or whatever. Now, if it got to the review and it was a surprise for the employee, then that's a problem, right? And that there's something else wrong there. Then the other 50% of the review all had to do with the, the technical stuff, whether you're an engineer or whatever you were, accountant, you got measured on that in terms of your quality and everything else that goes along with it. So, so anyway, principles and values for a lot of supporting process are merely slogans. Take a look at your posters around your company and see whether or not you have processes that support all those great things you say you're doing. Okay. And closing thought too, you're perfectly engineered to get the results you've already gotten. You want to change the results, change the process. You're perfectly engineered from every pencil that you bought, from every line you made in the parking lot, from every trash can that you placed around the company, from every post-it note, from every, you know, go down the list, from every minute detail, you are perfectly engineered. You get the results that you already have gotten. Okay. So think about that. The closing thought three, I stole this from Toyota, who says they get brilliant results with ordinary people running brilliant processes. We don't want to have unbelievable tribal knowledge and skill sets on the PhD level to be able to run our business. We want our process to be so foolproof, bad word, I shouldn't have used foolproof, mistake proof, foolproof is insulting, right? Mistake proof that anybody can run them with very little training. Okay. You can't make a mistake. I was in the Hino line in uh, Japan when I sold the Hino and I, and I asked to spend a whole day with my engineers in the, in the connecting rod cell. The youngest piece of equipment was 10 years old and it was unbelievable. The Pokioka Jidoka. And I asked the engineer foolishly at Hino, I said, Hey, where do you put your defects? He says, delicious son. We don't make defects in this cell. And I said, okay, dumb question mark, right? You could make, if, if I asked you to go in there and make a bad part, you wouldn't be able to do it, okay? 
So anyway, uh, they get brilliant results for ordinary people running brilliant process. Now, when they say ordinary people, that may seem insulting to some, but that's just kind of like the translation that they use when they say ordinary. They don't mean that you're ordinary. They just think everybody's special. Okay. But when they say ordinary, you know, no special skill set is really what they're kind of talking about there, right? So, so that's a powerful statement to think about that. Do I have a process that most anybody could run and get the results, you know, that I'm looking for? I would say most of us would say no, right? I know when I was running operations, I couldn't always say this either, right? Easy to say, hard to do, but it's something that you got to think about as you move through, right? Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm going to stop the sharing right now. Get back so you can see my pretty face on YouTube if you're watching. But, uh, but anyway, um, that was episode 25. Okay. My 10 rules of a process. I'd be interested in what rules I missed and what rules you would add to the party here. Okay. As you, uh, take a look at this presentation and how do you think about a process? Email me at mark at lean911.com, M-A-R-K, mark at lean911.com. Love to get your uh, thoughts. And we will see you next time with uh, episode 26, okay? Have a great one. Stay lean. And thanks for listening. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to the Lean 911 podcast. I'll be happy to address your questions or feedback on future episodes. Email me at mark at lean911.com. You can check out our other episodes by visiting our website at lean911.com, our YouTube channel, wherever you listen to podcasts. This is your host, Mark DeLuzio. Thanks for listening.